Hey guys, it's Anne. Welcome to the channel. Today we're going to be looking in on my red wigglers. These guys are troopers. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at my three red wiggler bins. They're in different stages of development. And so what we have here is kind of the um, middle child, if you will. This one's been going for a while. I'll put down at the in the bottom uh, how long it's been going. Then we have the brand new bin that's uh, started the last time that we did an update. And then we have the bin that is almost done and we are trying to migrate everybody out of the old castings. So we're going to start in the middle. So I did not look at the video to see where I fed, but what I can tell you is that the springtail population is not showing any sign <laughs> of slowing down. Um, I think it was uh, Michael uh, who mentioned that the uh, winter time is when we have the most trouble with the springtails and um, I think he's right. I think that we absolutely are having more problems with the springtails right now than we did a couple, you know, six months ago. So looking at the food that we found in here, it just looks like some sort of... Uh, wrapper uh, from a piece of fruit. So we're not, so far so good, we're not finding any food left over. Uh, I'll put, you know, below how long it's been since we've looked in on these guys. But, uh, so the moisture is still uh, very, very good. Uh, good thing it's not anywhere near me wanting to harvest because uh, it is definitely too wet to do any sort of light migration I'm not sure how inspired you could get them to move out of stuff that's got this good of moisture. So there's a banana stem. I'm just going to start picking everything out so that we can assemble everything together when we do get our feeding for today. Because it certainly, from what I can see here, definitely looks like they could use more feedings. The red wigglers always uh, surprise me in how much food they can go through as far as kitchen scraps. Now here is a reasonably new cocoon. In the books that I've been reading, it tells me that, and it makes sense I guess, the bigger the worm, the bigger the cocoon. So although the shape is dependent upon the type of worm that you're going to get, the size of the cocoon depends on how big the worm is that gives you the cocoon. Also, I know that, you know, there is a huge range in how many uh, babies come out of the cocoons. I've watched in the microscope, uh, you can look at a video, I'll link that below, on my microscopes, and I've actually watched like four baby worms come out before with the red wigglers, so I'm assuming it could be more or less, but every time that I've looked at a European nightcrawler, I only ever see one or two and they're much bigger wisps. The wisps that you get with the um, red wigglers here are usually super tiny, almost hair-like. Now here is a super dark cocoon. So that is either empty, I'm not going to try and squish it to find out, but that's either empty or it is very, very... Uh, oop. <laughs> and there is another cocoon right on my fingernail. These guys are super happy. But the darker the cocoon, the closer it is to hatching. And then on my finger also is a little wisp. Look at these guys playing nice for the camera. Red wigglers are always good babies. They're always cute for the camera. Look at them. Any cute? Put you over with the food. So we will keep looking through here to see, you know, if there's any food that I've missed try and keep it together so that they can concentrate their efforts. Uh, this bin's probably about halfway done. You can kind of see what the bedding is. I mean, because I know a lot of times people are like, how do I know when it's time to uh, harvest the castings? And one of the reasons that, you know, or one of the ways you know that it's time is that the bedding is completely unrecognizable and um, it also kind of gets a little sticky. Castings get very moisture retentive, and um, when they get going, they totally hang on to their water. So if it starts feeling sticky, like this isn't sticky, this is just damp. Um, 
But that's also another one of the ways. And I'm just seeing cocoons everywhere. Cocoons that are ready, cocoons that are in the middle. I think splitting the population has really helped with the uh, population boom. So there's a nice little tiny juvenile with a little baby snuggling up. It's his little brother. All right. So these guys are doing good, and I am not seeing any food. So I think I'm going to make a little ditch here in the middle and feed them up. Now, I don't think we need any more bedding at this moment. I think the bin is sufficiently full. Uh, I'm going to definitely let them work down that bedding before I give them more. So let me get some food. Okay, my son has cleaned out his fish tank and uh, we, or did some weeding in his fish tank. Now I'll be interested to see. Now these are snails. I think there's not a thing alive in here from the fish tank. Um, but it grows so fast he weeds about every other week. So I'm going to put this in here. I, I've done this with the African night crawlers. Um, but I have not tried that with anybody else. So let's see if the red wigglers will like the uh, whatever kind of fish tank uh, weeds those are, or grass or something. All right, and you got to love the sticker here. Literally, it says love. See? Cute. Not tempted to leave it in there just because it's adorable, though. All right, let's cover these guys up. And then we will go get another red wiggler bin. All right, this is the new bin that has been running the least amount of time. I think I'll probably just do the same thing here. Going to uh, start piling up the, the food that I find in one corner. And uh, so these guys are also doing a good job seems to be a really healthy population here. Um, yeah, so just going to keep going through here, seeing if I can find the food, picking off any of the old banana stems and what have you, piling them up for the next feeding, and then keep turning it over. This must have been the feeding zone. I'm seeing a peanut shell here. Seeing, I'm not really sure what that is, but it seems like it was attached to something. It must have been uh, pumpkin or melon or something down here. I'll put a picture there. I'll look up and see what the food was, and we can see what it's done and how long of time. People always find that interesting, like how long does it take my batch of worms to, to eat? And people who are new to the worm farming hobby, you know, are always like, how much do I feed? How often? And I know it sounds horrible, but it really does make a difference in how many kinds of worms, or how many worms, um, how old your bin is. That is one of the things that's really important. So like this is a brand new bin, and although it's got the castings from an older bin, this bin won't work through food as quickly because it doesn't have as many um, of the beneficial bacteria in here. So this you know, bin will take longer to eat uh, food. Let's see, oh, that's the kiwi skin. This stuff is so strange. It looks like a paper bag. There we go. Yeah, I was talking in the comments the other day. Um, I've been composting for, you know, more than 20 years, more closer to 30. I forget how old I am. But uh, I've been doing that for almost 30 years. I can't believe that I just started worm farming, you know, less than five years ago because this really makes quick work of the food and the paper and the cardboard that you have in your house. So, you know, and you know, instead of waiting six months for you know, something to uh, compost out in your outside compost, you know, the worms go through it so much faster. Um, that and I never really put cardboard boxes. Put in the comments below. Uh, did you think to put cardboard boxes and shredded paper in your compost pile before you got into worm farming? Or is that something you just recently kind of discovered like I did? I'm not sure what that was. Oops. 
Little worm got to fly there for a second. So yeah, that must have been all the food that there was. I'm just seeing some, some leftovers of uh, peels of different things. All right. So, but they are breeding. I can see a little tiny worm here. But yeah, like I was saying, um, you know, I just really, it never occurred to me to put cardboard boxes or food boxes. Um, it, all the different things that you can prevent from going into a, a landfill is just amazing. I mean, now I think for my family of three, we create maybe two bags of garbage a month. Um, whereas before I got into worm composting, it was quite a bit bigger. I mean, we recycle all the plastic and the glass and stuff like that. But as far as organic matter, I never gave it a whole bunch of thought. And hopefully people watching this channel will, you know, give more thought to things that they put into the garbage into the landfill and, you know, kind of make it a challenge to yourself. What can I do to reduce what goes in there? They've actually opened up landfills and did kind of like an archaeological thing, and they can still read newspapers that were put in there in the 1920s. Nuts, right? Newspaper. Worms can eat newspapers in a couple of months, but yet if you put it in the landfill, it'll be there for over 100 years. All right, let's get these little guys some food. bad winter for citrus. It just really been kind of tasteless. And I guess I feel less guilty about throwing food away if I know I'm giving it to the worms, right? <laughs> All right, well, let's cover these guys up. And then we will get the oldest of the red wiggler bins. All right, well, here we are with the oldest of the red wiggler bins. Now, I left the lid off of this so that it could start, you know, doubly encouraging the worms to move over to the the new bedding and the new food. So this is really dry. Let's see what we've accomplished here. Because I sometimes don't think that it's enough to just put food someplace else. Like you've got to make the bedding someplace they don't want to live. And I think drying it out is one of the best ways to do that. So I'm going to just kind of go through here and move anything that appears to be food over and then keep flipping this over so that um, it'll start drying evenly. Uh, one of the bad things about drying your bin out too fast is that the castings can turn into almost like little rocks. Um, so you don't want to dry things out too fast. If you put a fan on them, and I've done this, I'm guilty. I'm telling you from experience. If you get impatient for your castings and put a, uh, a fan on them, they're going to turn into little rocks. Um, so not only is it going to make your life miserable because they, well, here's an example. This is castings that was on top, and it's super hard. And you have to reincorporate it with moisture. Not only that, but if you let your castings dry out all the way, 100%, then you're losing the beneficial bacteria. Now, most bacteria will go into kind of a dormance, a dormancy. And so, you know, it's not gone forever. Uh, you can add more water and more worms and bring that bacteria right back to life. Um, but uh, you will have, you know, made your castings pretty much unusable for another, you know, couple of weeks or a month until everything... Uh, moistens back up again because you don't want these hard little balls. You want them to stay evenly moist and then, you know, when you do harvest it, then you will have good castings and um, you'll be able to harvest them, but then you will also have all the microbes that are important. I, was, I can't remember whose channel I was watching, but basically somebody had said, how do you sterilize the vermicompost before you put it in the garden so you don't have all of these, you know, helper bugs going into your garden? And most people who have been worm farmers for any amount of time were probably pretty horrified by that question. But 
you know, you try and not, when you've been doing it for a little while, you try not to be judgmental of people or you should try to not be judgmental of people because they don't know. You don't want to sterilize uh, worm compost because most of the things that make worm compost valuable is the biology. It's not just the worm poop. Um, the things that are helping are all of the things, all of the beneficial bacteria and fungus that goes through the worm's gut that is a part of the worm castings. It is the part that is important because that will continue in your soil to help make um, nutrients available. So it's not about NPK like the uh, any sort of fertilizer you buy at the store that is um, inorganic fertilizer. The NPK is not what is important about the worm castings. It's the biology and what it can do for your soil. And just like everything sticks together, that sticking together is also important because that gives your soil some structure and uh, helps break up things like clay and then also makes soil that's sandy um, better for your plants to grow in. So you don't want sterile uh, which is why you don't want your castings to 100% dry out. You want them to keep uh, that biology alive so that it can keep going and help, oops, getting too close to the edge there, and you know keep going into uh, your garden. All right, now I'm going to have to be a little bit more careful here and see what's going on close to the feeding zone over here. Obviously, they're not done moving over. There's still quite a few worms close to the feeding zone, but not in the feeding zone. So let me I'm gonna fluff them up a little bit, do a little bit of uh, aggravation to try and get them to be unhappy with where they're at. I'm going to move that over just a little bit. And then let's, let's see what we've got in the way of worms that have migrated. So that is still a good amount of red wigglers that have decided to come over to the feeding zone. But we still have a ways to go. They are not done yet. But that doesn't mean we can't go look at them and see what they're accomplishing. So still a good amount. Got a big old mango seed here. Let's see if it's ready or if it's got any friends. It looks like it's got some springtails and some mites in there. Oh, one worm. There's one worm in there. But I'm not going to deny them the pleasure of crawling around inside that, so I'm not going to break it all the way. But I will bury it down, and then we'll get them some more food so that the rest of them can scoot on over. Sticking with the theme with the other bins, I'm going to take this dry bedding that was on top and then I am going to give them some of that grass from the, the fish tank. And since there's some water in there, I'm just going to pour that in there. That dry paper will take care of it. Then since there's really no good amount of food left in there, I think I can be pretty generous with these guys and bust that open so that there's a good line of uh, food here that should entice the worms to continue migrating out of this material. All right, but you can tell there's a lot of worms that are not done migrating yet. But we'll flatten this out so we can continue drying this nice and slow. Oops, get over there and also making it inhospitable to the worms but still pretty good for the, the biology. So we'll kind of flatten that out a little bit, make sure that the food is covered, and then we will let them have it. These red wigglers have their own playlist and so I will link that below and then I'll also uh, put a link in for the last red wiggler video. If you like this video, give it a muddy thumbs up. If you're not a member of my worm family, click that subscribe button. And if you want to know what I'm doing when I'm doing it, ring that bell icon. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms and everybody. Have a good day.